Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about the industry and, and the industry of the future. It was so that a year and a half ago, the board of Sverea asked, uh, you can say themselves, do we know where we are heading? Do we know that our strategy is, is pointed in the right direction? Shouldn't we undertake a smaller study about the future of the industry so that we, if, if we get uh, some new information, maybe we need to change a little bit our strategy? I was given the task to do that. And um, I worked together with, with, of course, my colleagues. And we also took uh, a think tank on board, Kairos Future. Kairos Future is a Swedish think tank, uh, also, also with offices uh, worldwide. And they are, of course, working a lot about, with, with uh, ideas and, and things about the future. So we did this, we undertook this, this job, we reported it back to the, the board, and we did some changes. And it could have been a stop there. But we also said that there are some things in this, in this job that might interest people in the industry. So we wrote, wrote a small report about this, and we, now we have been out uh, giving presentations of this report about for, for a little bit less than a year now. And I will, will introduce this report to you today. The report, or the, or the material in the report, it is based on uh, a job that we, we, where we used about 400 experts from academia, from the industry, from the institutes, uh, from the political corner of the society, if you can say so. So it's a, it has been a lot of people involved in this. But uh, first, let, let me first take uh, you back to, to one thing. Late 80s. Do you remember this? The movie Back to the Future. It was quite an interesting movie, talking about the future. The future at that time was the 21st of October to 2015. So in a way, you can say we are beyond the future. Uh, Marty, the young guy in the, in the movie, he, he uh, talked a lot about things that he wanted to have in the future. He talked about giant flat TV screens. He talked about smart watches. He talked about Pepsi Perfect. And almost all of the things that he talked about, we have in the society today. We also have uh, self, uh, self lacing shoes has been introduced. We have robots uh, waitering uh, at the cafe in China. So, so a lot of things that he talked about, we already have in the society. But at least one thing we don't have. He was thinking that one good idea would be to have faxes, facsimiles, coming straight out of the wall. He could not foresee the big change with, with, uh, with uh, emails and, and uh, smart telephones that we can, where you can have the emails and so on. He could not foresee in such a disruptive change. But a lot of things that he talked about, it, it's uh, already in the society. Another guy, the Prime Minister David Cameron, he stood up at the World Economic Forum in 2011 and talked about the industry. And he said that we have to re-industrialize the society. It is very important that we re-industrialize Europe, he said. And a year later, in 2012, President Obama talked about that we, he, he, wanted, uh, he wanted the US to become uh, a manufacturing haven. And he also pointed out that additive manufacturing 
That, that is a technology of the future. So great leaders of the, of the society started in 2011, 2012 to talk about the importance of the industry. What we have seen in our studies, three technical revolutions we talk about. Revolutions that, that are a little bit, in a way, you could say, larger changes. We have seven trends. We have two uncertainties. And um, I will, well, we'll talk a little bit about them for. So let's talk about the revolutions and the uncertainties first. The technical revolution. A lot of people in the society today talk about that things are going fast now. It's, it's, go, it's, it's becoming complicated. It goes, things are going extremely fast and so on. And maybe it is so that we have come to a shift in the exponential curve that things are really going fast. If you, if you try to, to understand what, what the power of, of, of uh, an exponential development, you can say that if you have a linear model and you decide that you should take 30 steps and each step should be one meter, of course, then you should, if you do this right, you can walk 30 meters. But if you do the old chessboard trick and say, the first step is one meter, the second is two, the third is four, the, the fourth is eight, the fifth is, is uh, 16, etc., etc. If you take 30 such changes, then you can walk to the moon and almost back to the Earth again. That's the power of, of, of an exponential development. And a lot of things is, of course, happening in, in, in regarding digitalization today in the society. We talk about that this is extremely important. And if we can develop computer capacity and, and say that, that if you have a capacity that is, that has, the power is equal to what we have in the human brain, and the price for such a capacity is, is equal to one kilo of salt, then we can really make, make big changes in the future. But there are people, and we can also, of course, uh, develop robots that becomes very, very effective and so on. But there are people now raising questions about, do we know where we are heading with those robots? Professor Stephen Hawkins, Professor Teg Mark, for instance, both of them are raising questions regarding, do we know where we are heading? This is Amelia. She has been looking at you for a few minutes now. Amelia is probably the world's strongest or most uh, competitive cognitive robot at the moment. She is used by Shell at oil platforms as a person, you can say, taking care of all technical details, securities, and so on. She has also been used in, in, in um, customer service, at customer service desks. Been, been basically programmed so she, she can take care of about 30, 40% of the tasks at the beginning. But she works with, with human colleagues and she learns, and after a month she can cope with 60% of the, of the tasks, and, and in two months it's a little bit more and a little bit more. And she is doing this in 20 languages, in parallel. So in a way, I, I am, I am uh, also asking myself, do we really know where we are heading? with those extremely intelligent robots. So that's the technical revolution. The second revolution is the development revolution, where a lot of the development force or capacity is, is moving very much to, towards, uh, towards the, the Far East. In this picture, you can see the number of patent applications versus time. And all lines, and the lines represent different areas in China. 
And once again, you can see an exponential development. If we compare Sweden and China in 2005, the two countries had about the same numbers of patent applications. Today, China has well over 30 times as many as we have in, in Sweden. So development revolution is the second revolution that we talk about. The third revolution is what we call the thought revolution. This is the, the iPod. At the millennium, Apple, Apple was, was really in deep trouble regarding the economy. Stephen Jobs ha had returned to, to Apple from, from Disney. And uh, they were really thinking about how, what should we do in the future? What could be the product that, that we should launch? He, um, he met Stephen Fadell. Stephen Fadell had worked for, for Philips. Stephen Fadell has, had taken the MP3 player and thought that maybe we could add some things to, the, to this MP3 player and make it a little bit more interesting. Philips had said no, and, and um, he, he tested the idea on, on uh, Mr. Jobs, and Mr. Jobs said, yeah, th this, this, is, this is interesting. And they bought some companies, added some, some functions to this, and uh, launched the iPod. And I would say that the rest is history. I mean, we have the I, I, uh, iPad, we have the telephone, we have now, soon at least, the iCar. I think it is very, very interesting that an uh, uh, IT company in the future will produce cars. But, of course, the idea, you, you, you need to have, what is, could you say, the, the production must be perfect when you produce these, these, uh, these uh, oh, if it is an iPod or whatever. It is not in the, in the production or the production itself that makes you competitive. It's the, the thought revolution, that you, you have, are able of, of thinking ahead and, and to, to pr produce or, or come up with ideas about prototypes that will be, be uh, a very important thing in, in, in uh, developing new companies or, or existing companies. So the third thing we, we have called the, the thought revolution. But there is, of course, a couple of uncertainties. Uncertainties that we, we couldn't say for sure we are going in that or that direction. One of them is being the, the, the energy situation. A couple of years ago, the, the oil price, price was well over 100 US dollar per barrel. In January this year, it was lower than 30. Now it's uh, around 50 again. It's shifting very, very fast. And um, when we asked our 400 people about what do you think about the oil price in the near future, they said it, it will be a spread like this. Some people point out that, that it will be a very low price. Other points that, that it will be extremely expensive. So we said that... that um, Energy is an area where we cannot really for sure say that we are going in that or that direct direction. Some people today talk about energy for free, that that will be the, the future of the society. And if, it will be, if that will be the case, then a lot of new possibilities arises. For instance, as Steen make it, to use hydrogen for the reduction of iron, if the price on hydrogen will be low enough. Energy is one uncertainty. The other is the geopolitical situation. Also, in this case, we don't know really where we are heading. And um, we know that there are things coupled between these two areas where, um, for instance, 
the oil price, the existing oil price, is very much uh, uh, influencing the this economy of a state. Could be the Saudi Arabia, for instance. So there is a connection between these two. But there is also another trend, and, and the Economist took it up in one of their, their magazines a year ago and talked about the, the gated globe. That there is a tendency, not for an open globe, but for a globe with, with, which are gated and we have trade areas in certain, or the globe is divided into trade areas. And we preferably trade within those areas. So perhaps we are, are heading for a, a, a gated globe in the future. We don't know where, where these two areas are, are, are heading us, so, so we call them the two uncertainties. The trends then, the seven trends, all of them are more or less known to us. Some of them we, we have, have, have um, been dealing with for quite some time. Some of them are a little bit newer. Um, I have put them in, in, in this star, and um, I cannot comment on all of them today. I will comment on a few. But um, if we take them the, the, um, from linear to circular, that's on the political agenda. Very, very much that we have to do this. And, and uh, our 400 people, they were extremely clear on, this is, this is a must. From rigid to adaptive, talking about robots once again, the futurists that we talked with, they are extremely, extremely clear on that we have to, to no, the factory of the future will, will only have robots. And perhaps it is so that Warren Bettis, uh, say, if from the 60s, might be the situation in the future, where the future factory will only have two employees, a man and a dog. The man is there for feeding the dog, and the dog is there for, for seeing to that the man doesn't touch anything. So that, that might be the future. Ah, okay. Um, I will comment on three of these. Uh, I would like to comment on, on, on uh, from products to ecosystem. This has to do, of course, with the, the business models. The business model cannot only be producing a certain item. Uh, coils, for instance, steel coils, and selling them. You must add on. You must, you must uh, be able to, 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 to cooperate with your client or with your customers and teach them how to use your steel, for instance, in, in the best possible way. Or it can be a, a smartphone that, that should be used in the best possible way with, with a lot of, of add-on functions. So it will not be just the functions of, of the, the, the steel itself, if we take steel. It, 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 you, you need to have know-how about how the steel should be used in the most pro proper way. The second thing I want to comment about is, is going from lab to hyperfast crowds. This is a very interesting area. And I, 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 for sure, I think that in the future, the, the, the um, development departments of, of certain companies will be closed departments. It's the business of the future that is being developed. But on the same, at the same, on the same, uh, in the same context, there might be also so that hyperfast crowds is an interesting area. 
And recent studies have shown that if you go from working alone to working in, in a hyper-fast uh, crowd, then you can raise the ideas, the amount of ideas, with 380%. That's quite a lot. That's quite a lot to choose from. So I believe very much in that will be a balance between, so to say, secret development and hyper-fast crowds. Another thing that I think is very interesting is the additive manufacturing. It, it is still an, a technique where the productivity is rather low, uh, at least when you talk about producing components made out of metal. But um, it is definitely a technique that can be used for, for a lot of things in this society. And when you talk about a possibility to 3D print apartment buildings, and you can do this in a rather short time, then at least for me it says that, hey, this is a technique that might, might influence the future. We might do things much faster, and we will do it in, in, in good ways. 90% of the, the things that you have in a hearing aid today is, is uh, 3D printed in plastics. If we take in one area. Uh, drugs uh, sold at a pharmacy can be 3D printed in the future. The first license has already been given. That was in the US almost a year ago. When you can make the drug or, or the, the pill or the tablet in, in exactly the, the composition that I need for my disease. So I'm, I'm coming closer to my retirement, and, and um, I'm very glad that I can be cool at the end of my, my career. Going from nerdy to cool is, is the, one of the trends that we have seen. And what do we mean by this? What we mean is that, at least here in Sweden, we can see a clear tendency now that the interest for, for, for technical studies has, has increased during the last six, seven years. Since 2007, it has increased with 58%. Perhaps not a dramatic change, but an important change. And we think that there are two forces behind this. One is, is, is the, the fact that, that um, it is with new technique that we can solve the... the, the the, the problems that we have in the society. And the other thing is that people like Elon Musk, for instance, they, they, they are creating an interest for technique and what we can do with the technique. And this is an idea that, that is now being tested. And perhaps with this, with this kind of train, we can go from Beijing to, Bra uh, to Paris in two hours. Quite an interesting thing. Conclusions then. What, what our 400 people have clearly said that we, have it, we are facing a big shift going from talking a lot about structures to, to, to talking about very much about matters. Of course, the structures need to be there. You must have the, the owner's directives and management uh, con and, and control systems and so on. That's a must. But the focus it will be much more on, on innovations, products, business models, and so on. And for the steel industry, this is my, my view on this, that digitalization, big data, will be one important area in the future that will give us possibilities to, to make our products even more effective, in, in a more effective way. I am very much for, for the possibility to have people meeting, like we are doing here at ScanMet 5. It is important that we meet, discuss, and, and create new ideas and test ideas. And um, personally, 
I, I think this energy for free is very, very interesting. And, and perhaps we are heading in that direct, uh, direction. I'm not an expert, but I'm a believer. I, I, I hope that we are. So thank you very much for listening. And if you want to read the report, please uh, go in, on, visit our homepage and download the report. It's there in Swedish and in English. Thank you very much. Now we have uh, some time for questions from the audience, so please, Daniel will come with the microphone if you have a question. Don't be shy. <laughs> it's too early, perhaps. Maybe. <laughs> Can I have a question, Jovan? Mm, of course. Uh, coming from the raw material side and, and, and looking into the future on, on, on the demand and, and steel, new uh, type of steels, uh, for instance. If you look in, into the future, will there actually be, a, will there be an issue with material supply to the new, uh, I mean, if you print houses in, in uh, three stories and so forth, that takes a lot of material. Is that, is that an issue in the future? Is that something that you are discussing? Raw materials will be an issue even in the future, of course. We will have more circular economy. But to cope with, with um, impurities, I very much believe that, that we need to add new material to the systems. Um, we also know that materials are expensive. So, so from, a, from an economic point of view, we also need to, be, be, to take care of yields, et cetera, et cetera. And, and if you take additive manufacturing, the yield is not high at the moment. The productivity is not high, if we talk about, about uh, components in metals. So it's, it's only used for very, very special applications. But it's, it's there, and, and I'm a true believer. I think that this will develop. But it will not, we will not make the, the heavy plate by additive manufacturing in the future. No. Nope. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Well, if anybody has come up with a question in the audience, we can have it. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Chen Zhao from Purdue University in the United States. Great talk. Um, in your final comments on the future of the steel industry, your technical uh, revolution is digitalization and big data. Could you please elaborate a little bit? I think that today we, are, we, are, we have developed, for instance, process control systems for all the different steps that we are undertaking in, in producing the steel. From the blast furnace, the sulfurization of hot metal, to the BOF, to the ladle metallurgy, to, to continuous casting. But we don't know, we don't have systems that are, are actually evaluating if, if we have the best position to produce what is the most uh, difficult steel grades to produce. We just say that, that we do it now, and we expect to have a high yield, or the standard yield for that steel grade. Perhaps in the future, when, when we have, have with, with a big data analysis, we can see that now, at this moment, the steel mill is, is in, in a perfect condition to produce the most difficult grades. Then we can do it with extremely high yield. That's one way of, of using big data and, and, and the analysis systems that goes with big data. Okay. You cannot see the audience from me. No. So thank you very much thank, for thank. giving this speech. Uh, very interesting as thank. always listening yeah. to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.